Anyone hear me? Yeah, fine. We, we can start. Okay. We're playing, in, but I think we'll start. <coughs> Come on. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for your, uh, your interest in this talk. Um, my name is Simon. I'm, I'm a PhD student at the Autonomous Systems Lab at ETH, where we do mainly robotics. And since about two years, I've been working with, with Google, with Project Hango, uh, pretty much from the beginning on. So I joined them like in, in month three or something, and now it's uh, month 24 or month 25. Um, I will talk a bit about uh, what Project Tango is, and I will give you a sh short overview in case you don't know uh, what it is. But what I will also talk about is what actually comes after Project Tango, uh, which goes a bit into what my research topic is and what I'm interested in and what I believe should be uh, the future of um, mobile device localization, especially if we talk about lifelong localization, also for other devices. So what we do every day is actually uh, very remarkable. Uh, whenever you walk through cities, uh, across streets, uh, we have no problem uh, determining our own position, our own motion as we move around in, in 3D space. And uh, it doesn't really matter whether we are indoors or outdoors, we always know how we are moving. And this is really, really remarkable. Uh, a lot of people forget about that, but this is a, a truly uh, astonishing ability that we have. If we look at mobile devices today and robotics in general, um, this is not something that's that's available there today. So um, there are uh, mobile devices that you can buy today, and they give you like this position accuracy outdoors using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or GPS. But as soon as you uh, move indoors, all this information is gone, and there is no information anymore where you are precisely. And also, what all the devices um, are not able to do, what we humans can do, is tell you where you're looking and how you're oriented in 3D space, uh, which is very important if you want to overlay information or you want to play proper games. So let's assume that this would be there, and you would actually have mobile devices today that could give you very precise human-scale understanding of motion. And here are a couple of applications that we've been looking into at Google um, or at ETH. And this is actually a robot that's uh, flying around now at ISS. I will show you a video later, uh, which does uh, remote inspection. Here it's uh, with NASA Ames and like one of these zero-g uh, airplanes. One application is measuring furniture in your room before you go to I IKEA to find out where it fits and whether there is a problem getting it up the staircase. Uh, this is a program at Google, which is blind, which uses one of our early prototype devices to find its way around the building uh, so we can give him point-to-point -point navigation indoors, which is something that you're all familiar from GPS, um, from cars, but I'm sure nobody has that indoors at the moment. And this is just point-to-point -point navigation to uh, things that you're looking for in a supermarket. So this is just another application. So I already talked about these two technologies and that they're actually not sufficient for a lot of use cases. And in Tango, we wanted to do something, something different. We wanted to go with the accuracy down to a centimeter, centimeter level. And we wanted to do that by using the very same sensors that we humans do. We wanted to use our eyes uh, by replacing them with cameras. And we wanted to uh, replace our vestibular system, which is the system in the ear that tells us how we are accelerating and rotating in 3D space. And this is what you call an initial measurement unit. Everybody of you knows what this is because you all have it in your smartphones. Whenever you rotate the screen, this is done by an initial measurement unit, which measures what is the direction of gravity. And because it changes, uh, the screen can be rotated. You also know that this is very precise if you play games where you are balancing a small bowl and you have to put it through a riddle. This is an initial measurement unit that's doing that, and it's the same that we have in our ears. 
combining these two sensors is, is nothing new in robotics. It has been done for years already. So this is a helicopter from ETH where we do uh, inspection. This is um, a joint project um, with uh, University of Zurich where they have uh, KUKA uh, ground, rover, ground rover working together with some aerial inspection robotics. Uh, this technology is on Mars. Uh, driving around the rovers, and this technology is used for autonomous vehicles. So it's basically everywhere in robotics, uh, but it's not out there yet uh, on your mobile device to do better games and do better interaction. And the reason for that is it can be found if you look at this video, because this video shows what's happening behind the scenes. And behind the scenes, we are tracking in real time salient features in the environment. <clears throat> and by making the assumption that these features are static, we can then infer the motion of the camera by looking at how the features around us move. So this is very similar to what you, what we do. If you sit on a cart and somebody pushes you around, you're observing how the structure around moves, and you can infer how you must be moving because you know that houses are not moving uh, instead. But this is very expensive to compute. Um, in fact, you need to look at every single pixel of the image. You need to analyze it. Uh, you need to track it from one image to the other. And you need to fuse this information with this data from the inertial measurement unit, which comes in at like 100 or 200 hertz. So for a long time, this was not possible. And uh, this device here is uh, the autonomous car Stanley, which was driving 210 kilometers through the Mojave Desert in the DARPA Grand Challenge about autonomous driving. And it had this compute in 2005. And over the last couple of years, we've seen an exponential growth of compute in mobile. And now we've reached a point with the NVIDIA Tegra that's actually surpassing what's necessary to do this very long distance travel through the desert on a mobile chip. And it's actually inside this tablet now. And it has a normal chip size uh, is a couple of dollars um, and can do a, a marvelous amount of compute. It has 192 GPU cores. So the computer is there today. Uh, the question is, how can we leverage this compute and how can we integrate it into novel hardware and uh, yeah, build the algorithms that work on top of it? So in Tango, we have been looking at uh, a, a series of different hardware. So we started with something very simple, which was just um, two cameras. And we wanted to find out whether we can solve this entire problem with a consumer-grade IMU, an IMU that costs only $1. The challenge here is that through miniaturization, the entire measurement process gets very inaccurate. And if you think about the rockets that NASA uses to fly on, on the moon or on the Mars, they also use IMUs, inertial measurement units. But they have things that cost like $50,000 at this size and take about one month for 20 people to assemble. So they can fly forever, and this is not a problem. But if you do it with these consumer grade or miniaturized uh, IMUs, you have uh, a, lot worser, uh, a lot worse measurements that you need to process and that you need to cope with. So this was the question we want, want to answer here. And then we want to look in whether it's possible with a mobile processor, uh, shrinking the lenses. So this was about uh, this size, uh, like a thumb, basically. And the uh, camera on this uh, mobile phone that we see in the middle is actually just um, uh, 5 millimeters or 4 millimeters in diameter. So it's like um, a, a thing that you can integrate into a mobile phone. So this device does not look like uh, a proper thing you want to buy, but it's something that uh, showed us that it's possible. And on the right, you now see that the tablet that I have here with me, which is the thing that we ship 4,000 times now to developers, um, which is something that you would actually go outside and, and show your friends that you have something. The, the white and the others, you probably don't want to do that. So um, on all the devices, we have a, a set of cameras. We have a motion tracking camera, which you see on the left, which has a very wide field of view. It has 175 degrees opening angle the fisheye camera. And then we have a high resolution and uh, narrow field of view camera. And what they capture is very similar to what we humans have in that you get a peripheral vision that tells you how motion tracking and to, to perceive your motion. And then we have a focused area, which gives us uh, the ability to classify and identify objects with a close range. So these are the two, these two objects. This is a robot at ETH from one of my colleagues. So. And in Tango, we were a super small team, of course, in the beginning. So in fact, um, the two people in the back are just visiting researchers. And the team that actually started uh, is, is just a couple of people. So of course, one guy is not on the, on the image uh, because he's taking the picture. But in the beginning, we were just very small and uh, struggled to, to get the robotics research into a product. And what we wanted to do is to take the last 10 to 15 years of robotics research, the things that have been on Mars and on the rovers, and compress it and optimize it um, over months 
uh, and analyze what we need to change in order to bring it onto a mobile phone. And of course, you see we are all happy because this is uh, the, the second device that we got or the second mobile device we got. And we actually started making phone calls with it because we wanted to check whether it's actually a, a certain phone, a, a real phone. So what can you do with these devices and, and what is the main uh, algorithm behind it? And the main algorithm is what we see in this video here. And this is Joel Hesch, one of the main engineers at Google. And what we do is we track features in the environment, as we've seen in the other image or in the other video already. And then we can infer the trajectory of the device in 3D space. And this is like 10 meters now. Um, but we can move uh, way further. So what you see here is now a very high precision tracking of the motion of the camera in 3D. So you will see in a second that this is actually estimating how we move up the stairs. And you can imagine uh, what kind of application this enables. Yeah? So you can do indoor localization, which is kind of boring. But you can do games here and uh, augmented reality and information overlay in real time on a mobile device. So this kind of goes on um, for, a long, for a long time. Uh, you, what's funny in this video, I don't know whether you saw it, but uh, the first devices, they were the hardware was not well, there were some mistakes in it. So we always had to carry around the battery pack. So it was kind of a, a, a big of a setup. Um, kind of what we do in robotics all the times. So we wanted to do a mobile device, but then we had to kind of go back to uh, hacking things together as we do in robotics. So what you see here is that we can now return to the initial place. And we did some error, but we're actually pretty much ending up where we started. So in this video, I think we have like two or three met meters of error accumulated over this estimation. Um, which amounts to about 1% of final error. And this is super remarkable. If you think about yourself, you need to walk outside, closing your eyes, or being in an environment that you don't know, and then you tell me after 300 meters up to an accuracy of 3 meters where you are. I think nobody of us can do that. The trick we do as humans usually is that we recognize places that we've previously been before, and then we can uh, munch this information together and then say, ah, oh, yeah, I know exactly where I am. But actually, we don't have the ability um, of what we have on mobile devices today in terms of precision. So we wanted to find out whether it's robust. And uh, finding out whether it's robust, you can, of course, best do if you, do, uh, if you go on team building events uh, and do some measurements. So um, this is the device we've already seen. And you can, you can guess where this is in, but this is in a, in a zero-g airplane. And we did 24 parabolas. In the end, I felt slightly sick, I have to admit. But um, what you see here, too, is that we like have a measurement tax uh, placed around the airplane also here, which we surveyed. And we wanted to find out the accuracy without, without gravity. Because the information of gravity, as I already showed you with, uh, with this example here, is something that's uh, conveying a lot of information to us, because we always know where it's up and down. So once you take this away uh, from the math side, a lot of things change. So you can, of course, now guess where this video was probably taken. And um, this video is taken on board the ISS. And this is not autonomous. Uh, this is a, an astronaut pushing around the camera and, and the robot setup. But our vision for the next month is uh, to have actually these small robots equipped and autonomously navigating the space station in order to allow the ground personnel to look around and inspect things without the support of the astronauts on the space station. And uh, about a month ago, this was actually launched up, and they did some experiments up there uh, with the robots and, and our things. We also wanted to know how robot it, robust it is in very extreme motions. So um, <laughs> we, yeah, we did it on the weekend, of course. Uh, we went to Great America, like um, Joel, Joel Hesch and me, the engineer from the other video, and we wrote this. I don't know, like 20 times or something, because nobody was there for whatever reason. So we could stay inside all the time and write one after the other. And also here, you see that we get a 3D estimate of the trajectory. Um, you see also that this is very high dynamic motion, which we as humans are not able to track that accurately. And in a second, you will see that once we return to the initial position, we do accumulate, of course, more error than if we walk around. But it's reasonable. You will see that it's in a, in a range that's actually not too large. And OK, this is just for playing around. But we wanted to just see uh, when, when our algorithms break down and when it's not possible anymore to track motion. So in the end, we end up with something like 3.5, 3.6% of error. 
So this is a video that I took in Mountain View, and I'm uh, a bike enthusiast, so I mounted it on my helmet, and I drove around um, a lot in Mountain View. I have like terabytes of data from there. And the goal here was to build 3D maps. And what you can see here is that we can also do this recognition of places where we've previously been before and correct for errors over time. So whenever we revisit a place, you will see that parts of the trajectory snap back and errors that we have accumulated get corrected. And then you can make maps that are dynamic and you can overlay on uh, street maps uh, for autonomous driving or for navigation for pedestrians. Um, besides these two cameras that I already mentioned, we also have a depth sensor on the device. And this captures, instead of color, depth and shape. So you get instantaneous information of how far things are away. While we don't use this for motion tracking at the moment, what you can do with it is that you can take the depth information and combine it with the data of how the device moves. And then you can start building very large 3D models of buildings. So what we see here is Ivan, the other intern that was starting with me on the project. And what he's doing is he's uh, walking up all the stairs, of course, but then he is building up a 3D model, which is uh, some 5 to 10 centimeters accuracy, given the uh, odometry error that you accumulate over time. But this is already pretty nice if you think about playing games with physics interaction, where you let balls bounce off walls, or where you want to inspect structure, etc. So this goes on uh, forever. What's remarkable here is that these really overline, uh, overlay from the top. So there is a bit of an error, but in principle, it's pretty accurate. Um, Ivan is, is a fantastic engineer. So what he did, he uh, took the current research, which was deployed on uh, desktop PCs with huge GPUs. GPUs um, and he thought, OK, why don't we just put it on a mobile device? And why don't we, on top of that, just put it on a CPU instead of on a GPU? So he worked a bit hard. And in the end, he ended up with this. So this is a Qualcomm uh, processor with 2.4 gigahertz. And he can do what other researchers did up to now on a single core of a CPU, where others needed like hundreds of GPU cores in a desktop PC. And what he can do here now is combine the information of the depth camera with the information from the color camera and start building a 3D model of the environment in real time on a mobile device. So this is really nice if you think about architects that want to model existing buildings and then want to show their client what it would look like if they would relight parts of the environment with for a new uh, light design like we have here, for instance, or a new design with uh, new walls or anything. I mean, you're capturing structure and you're capturing texture. So you get a pretty rich uh, information set of this. Uh, where this is also nice, if you think about people that move out and start measuring uh, the environment for inspection, for instance, they want to have immediate feedback of whether they have coverage. Um, you can imagine how costly it would be if an expert goes to a certain industrial uh, appliance, uh, measures something, goes back to the office, does the data analysis, finds out, oh, I missed like one slice of the building, needs to go back and forth. So this real-time feedback is something that's really important. And you can, like, again, incorporate the structure into games. So, um, and now we quickly go to what I, what I said would be my research, because I think there's actually more than VR and games to it. And being uh, a roboticist, I think uh, localization for mobile devices is very important, and this is my research. But there is also warehouse automation and transportation, if you think about robots driving in hospitals. There is also inspection and change detection. If you think about uh, mines, if you think about uh, any building construction site, you want to monitor, you want to measure, you want to know what's going on. And then you can do autonomous driving, of course. So this is my colleague, Jörn. And what he did is he took a laser scanner, which measures a 1D laser, uh, 40,000 uh, 40, measure measurements a second. And he attaches that laser to this visual inertial system that we also use in Tango. So now he knows for every ray of the laser, where it was shot off the laser, given the estimate of the vision. So of course, you need to take care that everything is synchronized correctly and calibrated, which is his research. It's actually crazy hard. But once you've done that, you can build very nice models of larger structures, which are centimeter or millimeter accuracy. This goes beyond what we can do in Tango with the depth camera, because the accuracy is limited. But this is something you can actually probably build a building from, because it's like millimeter accuracy given the laser. This is uh, work of some other of my colleagues, uh, which use visual inertial navigation for uh, industrial inspection. And 
I will show you in a second uh, what we're doing there, but they are using what I'm working on to localize an MAV all the time in the same area. So they can fly a certain path 100 times autonomously and always measure if something changes over time. And if you think about uh, things like Fukushima, for instance, where you want to know if something is happening early, uh, and you don't want to send an expert in there and getting radiated every day, you send such an MAV and you let it fly over and over the same trajectory. And then there is autonomous driving, and this is uh, Paul, my colleague, who, who left us last week. But he, is, uh, he has been working with Volkswagen on integrating the Tango um, kind of sensor setup with an inertial measurement unit and camera into a car. And what's nice about cameras here, again, is that they are very small. So we see in the front and the rear logo merely a small spot of where the camera is. And in the mirrors, we probably wouldn't have even noticed that there is a camera. And this entire sensor setup that we see here, you can probably get for about $20. While what Google uses with this expensive laser on the top is tens of thousands of dollars that you need to buy. And then you need to take care that you don't uh, miss the garage height, of course, also. <laughs> so what they capture, this is also fisheye images, so you are kind of familiar with this already. They, we have like omnivision all around the car. And then we looked into how can we use this for autonomous parking? And this is the map that we construct of the environment and consists of some of the 3D structure of this parking lot in, in Wolfsburg. And what you can then do is you can, again, track your own position in real time on the car using a map that you build of the environment. And what we want to do in this project is that you take your car, you drop it off in front of the uh, Hauptbahnhof or um, the airport, and you press a button on your smartphone. And the demonstrator we have today is driving back into the parking lot autonomously charging itself because it's an electric vehicle. And then when you want to pick it up, you can press another button on your smartphone and it comes out of the garage in front of the uh, pickup zone. Well, this is only a toy example. Imagine this being available in any car in the city. And you, some of you might be living in uh, center Zurich and some of you might be having a car and searching for parking lots for some time. So for these people, it's interesting. Drop off your car in front of your house, go inside and let the car park itself. It will tell you where it is, so don't worry. Or it can come back uh, autonomously later. Yes. <laughs> so all these applications have in common that you want to reliable localize all the time uh, from a 3D map. And um, you want to very precisely track your posts. And you want to relocalize even if the environment changes. You can imagine outside there are trees, there are different lighting seasons, etc. Everything changes all the time. So in order to do this, we need to combine data from multiple visits. So we need to combine data from the spring, the summer, and the autumn into one combined map that we can then always use for localization, even if the environment has slightly changed. So this video shows something that I did at ETH, where we are where I collected data sets, uh, six data sets in parallel with the Tango devices. And the goal here was to see what happens if you actually try to combine all the data into one map. So I moved up all the stairs, and then I returned to the initial position. You see that we do have errors between the endpoints of the maps, but um, given an algorithm that can recognize places, you can then correct for these errors. What you can also use this algorithm for is to find where trajectories overlap. So you can now combine data from multiple users that don't know about one another into one common map that covers the entire building and allows you localization everywhere. So this aspect of it is interesting because you can think of one guy moving once through Zurich Airport, mapping the airport. And then you have kind of a crowdsourced mapping where people start moving in, localize a bit of the map that's existent, but augment it with their own data over time. There are, of course, huge challenges. And I just want to quickly show this with these, these images here, um, which show one year of experience that we captured in the Volkswagen parking lot, where you see, of course, cars are moving around. And then the trees are, um, are leaving their leaves, and the sky is changing, and so, and so on. So these are the challenges that are still not solved, the challenges that we work on in research at the moment. So, what we do here is that we take data, as I said, from multiple units. So here we see six units um, traversing um, University of Zurich at the same time, or not at the same time, but in this uh, video at the same time. And they were actually captured at different weeks and different times of the day. So students are moving in and out and so on. But now you can combine this data 
and merge it into one representation. And you can see that all the clutter has cleared up because we have started removing all the students that only appeared once and were not seen on the, on the next day. And these models can then be used for localization online. What we see here now is that we have a set of different um, observations from a parking lot. And here you see how we localize online from it. And these colored points that you see in the video, which is um, on, the, on the lower right, is that the information is coming from entirely different seasons. So we're using maps that were built in summer, in spring, in autumn, and used all the information that's available and useful for currently localizing here uh, near, near Christmas. And this, I just want to show you that this is something that we start to analyze only today, um, probably what we humans can do um, easily, recognize places as they change without any problem. So one of our research at the moment is how can we select the correct data, because keeping everything is infeasible, of course, as we see from the blue curves. So we look into selection strategies of how to select the correct data over time and how to infer what's useful, what's not moving, what's, what's changing. So these plots we can probably skip. But what's, what you can do with these now in the end is that you can very precisely localize off a map. So what we see here now is, um, is yellow dots is the model that somebody else has recorded uh, of a piece of uh, University of Zurich. And in real time, we now see um, our current device localizing off this, off this um, model. And these blue rays denote um, associations between the current image and the 3D model in real time. And what this enables um, for you is something that I will show in the, in the following video, um, where I talk about how this scales. Well, let's just go forward quickly to the video. Because what this means is that once you can correctly register a model to your current view, which is the model is here denoted by the yellow dots, and the fact that they overlay with the building means that we know where we are with the camera. And wh why this is interesting is that knowing where you are allows you to overlay information now. So imagine that um, instead of having these yellow dots, you can now overlay a label which says, this is a certain restaurant. You need to ins uh, enter the building at this certain spot here through the gate on the left, or this, whatever, this, the shop here has certain ratings, etc. You can imagine that whatever information you want to overlay in the environment, you can now precisely track in, uh, in real time against very large models. So this is a model that's uh, one and a half kilometers big. And my research is how to compress them and how to stream them down from the cloud in real time. So what we are used from Google Maps with the tiles. But once we have done that, you can imagine that you can play games and overlay information in real time on any mobile device um, doing precise six of tracking. Yes, and then at this point, uh, I believe we have given all the devices a human scale understanding because they now understand very small motions indoors and they understand these very large motions outdoors and they have the ability to perceive changes over time and localize from a map um, given this data and learning uh, how, how things change over time. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. I think here we're streaming the whole thing to our other offices, so take the mic if you have a question. Okay, so as your research uh, topic is anyway the data and the compression, um, I was curious to understand um, uh, how you save it and just roughly and um, what the data sizes are basically. Okay. Because I don't expect that you're saving all this video. Yes. To reprocess it, right? So, yeah, the two, the two slides I skipped uh, kind of represent it. What's important for localization are these uh, 3D points in the environment and the description of them. Um, the description is usually built from a small image patch around an interest point. So the points we have been tracking throughout all the videos, you can imagine that you uh, take a small image patch, a couple of pixels, like 8 by 8 around this interest point, and then you can compute a description from it, which is compact. So you can imagine that all these points, uh, all the blue points, have a description of how they looked like when I first saw them. So what I can do now is, in my current image, I do the same extraction. And then I do a search for the nearest neighbor of my descriptions in the image in this 3D model. 
when I, when I have this information, then we can do what we also do as humans. So imagine you are somewhere in Zurich and you start seeing a couple of churches and a couple of like landmarks and you know their description because you've seen them before and you compare your knowledge with what you're seeing now. And given the knowledge that you like probably uh, have saved somehow where these things are, you can infer your own position. So let's say you see Hauptbahnhof from Bahnhofstrasse you don't need to do fancy computations. You immediately know that you are somewhere in Bahnhofstrasse because you see the central station from a certain place or a certain viewpoint. So the challenge here now is first to select the right data. So we only select a subset from these points, which gets us down from like 140 megabytes to 19. And then this is one of the most more recent work that I did. We apply compression, which is trying to take into account like um, like, yeah, how the appearance changes over time and how things are correlated in the image. And then we can go down to something like 600 uh, kilobytes for one and a half kilometers, which is a size I think that we can start streaming. But from the principle, it's very similar to what we do. We remember how things look like and where we saw them, and then we can like back and forth where we are. Can we reapply this also to existing images then? So you take the street view and you just run through it on one of the yeah, I, educational engines? And I actually don't have um, data yet, but I do have a student at the moment who is working on this. So the goal is to take street view data and then to feed it into our system and, and get the things together. Yes, this is uh, definitely something interesting. What about applying this to existing footage? I don't know, bypass. This is this is uh, this is not a problem. So it's good if it's recorded with our devices because it has a certain we know the quality and the drawbacks of it. Um, but of course, uh, since some of the technology is a bit new, you are of course also processing a lot of old data, like data that you recorded like years ago or somebody else recorded years ago. So this is possible. It's not. In fact, most of the experiments that I did in the last years were from somebody else like data from somebody else. Did you also experiment using this for guiding blind people? Because it seems to me that for a blind person, having the machine telling her like there yeah. is an obstacle in your way, or there is the door, like a bit more to the left, don't walk into the wall. Yes. Uh, the only problem there is that a lot of people thought that they could solve this issue with technology already, and somehow it was always the wrong thing for the blind people. Um, we did start working with uh, this developer at Google who is, who is blind and who has kind of a technology understanding and also can tell us what sucks and what needs to be changed. So for him, we, uh, we actually made a, a version which was doing like text-to-speech and was telling him where certain meeting rooms are. And he played around with it a couple of days. But the problem in the beginning was that our things were not really stable. So he was still using his guide doc uh, as a backup. Um, now it would actually be better and further. Um, and I hope that given the developer tablets are out, people will now approach this. I mean, we do write some apps, but we still rely on like the developer community, which actually knows better what the problems are in the real world to, to solve them. Any questions from the other offices? No, no question from Freebrook. OK. Uh, I think uh, you might have said that, and I missed it. But I think the main question is, when gon are we going to have this in our pockets? Yes, so um, um, on Google I.O. last summer, um, LG Electronics announced that they uh, want to put this technology in one of their mass market devices. So um, this, should, this should appear in 2015, so this year uh, at some point. Uh, we are working with them, of course. Um, I don't know the exact state of this collaboration, um, but we are working on it, so it, uh, I, it should be coming. And so we have a device here, right? Um, uh, Odi has it. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, have, you, have you done anything with it yet? No. Um, uh, do you have a plan? Does anybody have a plan? 
Okay, yeah, that's a that's that's what opportunity sounds like. Um, uh, I think what I don't know which which device do you have? Do you have a tablet? Okay. Yeah, it has improved a lot recently, like in the last two or three months. So, uh, and there are a lot of examples out there which kind of uh, inspire a bit what you can do with it. So we have a lot of games, and we have like uh, indoor navigation examples and, and this kind of things. And perhaps this is something that inspires. So, what is the path for developers to get into this? Is there like so you go, I mean, it's probably not in the stage where you say, OK, you go to that website, and there's a tutorial, and do the ABC. Um, it's more complicated, I guess. So at the moment, um, it's, it's, it's the following way. You need to apply still, because it's, um, we only have a couple of thousand devices. Um, but then there is actually a, a vast amount of resources at the moment already. So there is a full set of tutorials in an SDK. So this is actually uh, where most of the work in the last year went into. And um, there are already communities, of course, like the Google Plus community has a couple of thousand people in there that uh, discuss problems and um, yeah, show share apps and, and so on. And then there is a community on Stack Overflow, which is moderated by people from Tango. So there is actually a lot of drive behind from, from the Google side to solve problems and to, to understand what's not working. So at this point, I think it's probably like the Qualcomm SDK or something, it's something pretty mature where you can actually work with. And it's a public website now, so the SDK is actually accessible by everybody, which it wasn't at the beginning. It was only linked to the devices. Cool. So anybody has an idea, maybe for their current project, their current client, um, uh, how this could be clickable? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give them to this. Give them to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think we should finish up. The last question I have, um, do you expect the hardware to stay as it is now? So that part's done and all the further development happens on the software side, or do you expect more advances on the hardware side as well? I mean, we have seen, like in both camera and IMU technology, we have seen uh, big changes in the last years. So I expect that this is also going to be updated over time, um, just because like if you look at the smartphones a couple of years ago and you play such a games, such a game, it was very jittery and it wasn't working. And this is much better today. So there should be uh, further progress on this side. But yeah, I'm I'm a software person, so I mainly look in the software side. So are we. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure if someone is interested in um, hacking around on it, talk with Audi. I'm sure we'll have a hack day. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Cool.